Any questions or comments, anything anybody wants to say uh, before we get started with today's topic? Just a reminder that, uh, so like the plan is next Monday, I'll come in with the uh, midterm exams, okay? So keep that in mind. Um, and I will probably try, I'll try to send out an electronic copy as well afterwards so that you wouldn't have to retype anything on the exam. And you can use that to, um, you know, write your exam. But I'll hand you out a paper copy. Um, Okay, well today what I wanted to do was kind of, you know, I mean, most of you have taken my Intro to Political Thought class and you've learned something about Marx, uh, Karl Marx already, and the basic theory of Marxism, and your chapter covers that. We will do some of that, but I did kind of want to uh, give you something else that maybe you haven't gotten before that might also provide us with a framework, another framework with which we can view ideologies uh, generally. Um, as it says here, I had you, I had you watch this little brief uh, video of Christopher Hitchens, who's a left-wing intellectual. Um, Todd Noli's lecture references Aaron, Eric Goblin. If anything, he leaned to the, to the right. Um, and what I think is interesting about this topic is that Hitchens and Bowen might have come from very different, say, political, social perspectives, and yet they both make the same sort of connection between religion and political ideologies. Um, with Hitchens sort of saying, well, you know, religion sets people up for ideologies. It, it creates this uh, a large group of people who will sort of believe in, um, you know, claims, very grand claims, let's say. And then we have Bowen, who does not put it that way, but instead the problem with ideologies is precisely that they're not religions, but they sort of hijack the religious sentiment. Okay? Um, so they have very different views about religion. Christopher Hitchens was well known for being a real critic of religion, you know, um, a really convicted atheist. Bowen, came from a Catholic or more of a Catholic perspective, certainly wasn't a critic of religion, um, somebody who actually was trying to sort of separate out religion's role from the world of politics and, and basically arguing we have to have a, a, that separation between the two, not just legally, but in our minds. Um, but they both end up making a similar point that some of the mass movements um, that can do, that have done a lot of damage, <coughs> resemble and in some way tap into uh, people's uh, religious instincts, you might say, or religious proclivities. And this is partly what gives them so much power. And of course now we have political Islam, which, which actually um, combines a, you know, a faith tradition directly with political movement. Uh, and so uh, if we understand this perspective, we might be able to even understand better why it is that political Islam is so very um, attractive to people, um, why, why it has had so much pull with so many people. Um, so, but but we're, we're talking about socialism and communism at this point. We can apply this also to fascism. Um, in fact, they did. Uh, Hitchens as well as, as Vogelin do, and also Carl Jung, who was a Swiss psychologist, uh, who you may or may not be familiar with, but he made the same argument about communism and fascism in particular. Um, you could also make the argument that democracy falls in there. I haven't seen as many, I haven't seen anybody quite make that argument, but when people criticize the idea that democracy can be spread or should be spread globally or that it's the sort of the answer for everybody, um, it get, kind of gets into that territory perhaps. Okay. So because Vogelin's not exactly easy to understand as opposed to Marx where you can kind of understand the basics fairly easily and you guys have all been um, more or less gotten some information about Marx, uh, I wanted to spend some time on Vogelin. Um, 
your, you know, this will help hopefully with your understanding of the Noli lecture. By the way, Todd Noli was a graduate student of mine, and he was quite happy to continue to let me use this lecture. He went to NIU for a while, uh, pursuing a PhD in political philosophy, and then he decided that instead he wanted to go to law school, so he went to Duke Law School, he got his law degree, and um, now he works in New York City for some big law firm. I don't know, I can't remember which one. But anyway, so he was brilliant, and he, this lecture was really good, and I just wanted to continue to use it. All right, so Vogelin is famous, most famous for this multi-volume work, which is entitled Order and History, and he authored it between the 50s and the 70s. I think it's got six volumes in it. Um, so it's a, it's a really massive work, and it covers a lot of ground. And uh, what we're talking about is just one argument in a much larger work, but it's the argument that really kind of characterizes Vogelin's thought, the framework with which he looks at a lot of history and a lot of political and social philosophy and religion. Okay. Uh, so um, Vogelin argued that human life, in fact human nature, is characterized by what he called the search for the transcendent. Okay. Um, Vogelin was annoyingly good at using fairly complex language, sometimes even invented by himself, not in this case, but um, in order to express ideas that he didn't think were well captured by the existing terminology. Okay. When he says that life is characterized by a search for the transcendent, it means something like human beings are instinctually geared to, to seek something higher or beyond themselves. And typically in the human past, this has been um, expressed in various religious observances and various religious traditions. Okay? Um, they have a vision, he said, of an unachievable moral order, that is a sort of perfect moral order. It does vary from place to place and time to time, but there's this similarity or this commonality that people envision something much better than their current life, okay? Um, and this pulls them upwards. Uh, and this is sort of part of the natural human state. In the 20th century in particular, we had mass ideologies develop, um, communism and fascism in particular. Um, they, he said, imminentize or attempt to imminentize eschaton. Well, that takes a little bit of, um, uh, translated. Okay. Um, to imminentize something means to bring it down to earth, okay. to make it worldly. So, and the eschaton refers to the idea of this, more or less this perfection, this unachievable moral order that, say, Christians, for instance, believe will happen after death, or will happen um, during the second coming of Christ, or, or at some point in the future or in some other realm. So ideologies bring down to earth, attempt to bring down to earth this unachievable moral order. Okay? That makes sense? I see people getting lost. <laughs> in other words, let's take communism, which is what we're going to be talking about. Communism has this idea that people can live in a state of total sharing that we can live without class, without crime, uh, you know, in which people will really see each other as social beings, right? Uh, without a sense of selfishness. And that we will all move forward together. You know, there's this idea that no one can advance unless all advance and all of that. Which really sounds, if you think about it a bit, fairly close to the Christian ideal, to be quite want, okay? Um, but for the Christian ideal, there's this notion that human beings are sinners, and so we can never achieve this perfection in this life, right? So all we can do is hope for the best, and we can confess, and we can continue to try to be better, but we're always going to be imperfect. And this is why we need a government with laws and law enforcement, because human beings will never transform in this life. We'll wait until the next one. 
But the communists like Karl Marx said, no, you know, we can be very different if we change the way we live. Okay? And we can achieve some of these moral ideals that he doesn't even want to use the term moral. They will not be moral because they will simply be the way that we live. Okay? And it will be better. So we bring, and you know, one kind of shorthand way to think about this is we bring the vision of heaven to earth. Okay? And there were many socialist <coughs> visions, not just Karl Marx's vision, but some of you have studied Thomas More's vision. Um, Many socialist visions came before. Um, you know, some of them were not as, I guess, um, hopeful that this total vision could be realized as Karl Marx, though, because as you know, Marx had this notion of history unfolding inevitably towards an end of history in which we really would achieve this in all of its perfection. Okay, so in this way, he said, ideologies like communism make the transcendent, the ideal, um, which was otherworldly, worldly. That's what that means, okay? Okay, makes it, make, attempts to make it worldly so that we can live it out, okay? Any questions about that? Because that's the basic idea there, kind of in a nutshell. We sometimes then refer to these ideologies as secular religions. Part of the fascination with them is that people attach themselves to them or have, you know, in, in human history, sometimes with a zeal that reflects the most zealous of religious believers, with the, you know, um, the, the ability to fight wars, to, you know, force people to do things that they don't want to do, um, all for this vision. So you know, I mean, the history of the 20th century was full of wars and totalitarian regimes that attempted to make people into the new man, whether it was the new communist man or the new fascist man, okay? which, which involved racial purity. Okay, so uh, I'll just make a, a brief reference to Carl Jung. He was a Swiss psychologist who made a similar argument uh, with, his, with his psychological analysis, basically saying this was a part of the human psyche uh, that begins to change with the scientific revolution, with the enlightenment, a questioning of religion, which, uh, you know, he doesn't really ask the question, is religion, uh, does it embody some sort of truth? But he does say, as it becomes questioned, then people, of course, automatically uh, transfer that psychic energy, you might say, to something else okay, um, that they could believe in. Um, Vogelin uses the term Gnostic um, to describe these ideological movements. Gnosticism was this notion, which goes way back to ancient times, that there's a secret and hidden truth within reality, and the faithful and the truly you know, wise will be able to discern the secret truth that underlies, you know, history and underlies reality. Um, modern ideologies will often claim that they know that secret hidden truth behind reality. In the case of Marx, that would be class and the motivation of class and the idea that class conflict actually is what underlies pretty much everything else, you know, the, remember in hopefully in the intro class, the base of the superstructure, right? The base was, was the economic class, right? Superstructure, everything else, government, religion, okay? Culture. So this underlying reality that only the, the, the wise know, in this case the, the communists, is that you know, all of these other things are just emanations of this hidden agenda. And of course, with the, so with the ideology of communism or fascism, that secret underlying <coughs> reality, okay, is going to eventually be revealed, okay? Can you see again the, the sort of similarity between that and, and religion, okay? At some point in the future, we will have, you know, the communist revolution, and the communist revolution will spread globally and we will have the new man. At some point in the future, in the case of fascism, we will have you know, racial purity. We will have you know, the 
the right order of things will be fully completed and then everything will be much better. Okay? Any questions about this? This is a lecture for people who might want to go on into political philosophy, by the way. So I give everybody a little bit of everything, right? Um, but I don't want to leave people behind. I know this is kind of unusual stuff. Um, so feel free to ask questions. Okay, so Vogelin said that human beings normal, natural, kind of the, you might say, psychologically healthy state was what he called in-between, the in-between state. We live in between the transcendent, which is the divine, which we see is above us. Or if we don't believe in God, at least we have this notion <coughs> that, that, that we do not define uh, the truth, that the truth lies behind, you know, beyond us. Right? That normally in human history this has taken, um, taken the, uh, it's been embodied by the notion of the divine. Okay? So we live in between the divine and the merely animal. We're not animals, but we're not gods, in other words. And, and we live in, in this kind of uncomfortable existence between the two. We don't want to live like animals. This is why we develop civilization. This is why we develop moral rules, right? Sense of you know, going beyond the animal, such as the idea of heroism, honor, courage, those kinds of things being exalted. Okay? It gets us a little closer to the divine and away from the animal. So the divine calls us upward to be better than we are, you might say, or better than mere animals. Okay, uh, But the physical part of us pulls us downwards okay, and kind of grounds us. It's not bad in Bogum's view, the physical part is, is half of who we are, okay? And it grounds us so that we do not think that we can go on and do God-like things, right? So our experience of our own body is what creates this sort of self-awareness um, and, in a sense, self-interest or selfishness even that is not necessarily completely bad. So these are a couple of terms he uses, uh, pneuma and phusis, which is spirit and body. We are both spirit and body in our, in our experience. So what goes on with ideology in his view is that ideologies are an attempt to eliminate this in-between existence. To move from being in-between divine and animal to becoming divine. And in the past, this was the ambition of the saints and the hermits, you know, the people who would go off into the wilderness and attempt to live an extraordinary life, right? A total, say, total self-denial, right? They might go and live in a cave or in a, a prostitia or something like that and become a completely, attempt to become a completely spiritual being. You know, this is the, the ideal of the yogi who can walk on nails or walk on hot coals. They, they try to, you know, transcend to a, to a different plane. Okay. Um, but in modern times, instead, he <coughs> said what we get is we get people wanting to achieve a more godlike status through joining in political movements, um, typically with a godlike leader, okay, like a Vladimir Lenin or a Joseph Stalin uh, or an Adolf Hitler who embodies for them this, this something greater. Um, you may remember in the video I showed in the Intro to Political Thought class that during the Stalinist era in Russia, Stalin had statues of himself everywhere. He had murals of himself everywhere. They organized parades and you know, all sorts of mass political displays that were very colorful um, so that people could kind of enact in a way their worship of Stalin. Okay? Stalin became or attempted to become their god. Okay? Same thing in Hitler's Germany or in Mussolini's Italy. Lots of parades, flags, 
symbols, um, statues, pictures, banners, and people encouraged to take part in these, in these mass actions that would make them feel unified and a part of something greater than themselves. The leaders represented that higher life. In the case of fascism, this was really explicit. The fascist Hitler and, and Mussolini and the people that they drew from, whom we'll be studying later in this course, um, talked about you know, the liberal ideology being like the animal existence because it was about the economy. And the fascist ideology was about being higher than that, you know, being higher than that and, and better than that. Uh, in the case of communism, it, it expressed itself more through actions and not through that kind of direct language. Right? So, Vogelin noticed this, you know, this is the attempt of the every man, you might say, the, the average individual to identify himself or herself with somebody that he, he or she perceives to be in this higher state, right? Of the, and to, to therefore become like that in a way that he or she couldn't do so on, on their own. Okay? So in that way, mass ideological movements really are spiritual in nature. And they become dangerous because that spirituality that's expressed is so powerful. Vogelin didn't think that we would lose that spirituality. It would just be transferred to something else. Okay, and so Vogelin's argument and Jung's as well, but not Hitchens, uh, you know, went towards there needs to be a sort of preservation of the acknowledgement of the spiritual realm in order to prevent mass movements like this from occurring. Hitchens just believes if people were truly understanding of what atheism means, they would not believe in mass movements either. Okay, so there's a difference there about how to handle the problem. Okay, so with, again, any questions about Vogelin's point of view? You basically understand it, or is there any part of it that you want me to try to explain more? It's kind of a psychological theory in a way, but he doesn't put it that way. Okay, so with that in mind, socialist ideas, as I said, don't start with Marx and Engels, um, but with philosophers and theologians, and actually even in the Bible, if you go and take a look at what some of the early Christians thought Christianity about, it was partly about you know, sharing everything, giving stuff away, right? Um, living completely or as close as possible to be without private property to be able to go wherever they needed to go without being dragged down by it. Um, <clears throat> and uh, a concern not so much with material sharing in that case, but with the spiritual life. Okay. So they gave up things in order to live a more spiritual life. And as we moved into you know, the Middle Ages, Christians came up with visions of what you might call socialism. So we'll talk about some of that. But I did want to talk about an even earlier vision of communism uh, that some of you may have learned about. Uh, we talked about it a little bit in my class. Um, Plato's Republic. Plato has a notion of communism that he develops pretty well in the Republic. Um, in, and it has to do, not it's not the spiritual development, but the intellectual development of people that is aimed at here, okay? Um, and the notion that, that without communism, at least in the top two classes, the philosophers and the soldiers, you can't have the real unity and caring about the community, okay? Because the reasoning was if we have property, and if we have private families, we will think about those things and not about the common good. Okay. So Plato went even so far as to say perfect communism should mean, at least for those top two classes, no marriage, 
no spouse with propriety, which means uh, actually the government decided when people would mate and who would mate with each other to produce the best offspring. Children were raised communally in those two classes, and this would achieve, he said, that absolute dog-like loyalty to the community as a whole, as we would raise them to think of the community as a whole, as their family. Okay? So now whether Plato was serious about this or not is an open question. People argue about that. But whether he was or not, his point seems to be in order to achieve absolute perfect justice in his view, you have to uh, get rid of property. Okay. And this is in the Republic. This is in the Republic, right. Especially in books four and five of the Republic, right, where he's developing the three classes and he says, you know, the working class is the largest class and it will remain with private property. And it's the class that will produce all the things that people need. But when it comes to the warriors who protect the society and the philosophers who lead it, you can't have that self-interest involved or they won't be able to do their job. Mm -hmm. Have you read The Giver? Yeah, a long time ago, yeah. Um, does that in any way relate to Plato's Republic at all? Yeah, I felt so at the time. Yeah, do you want to, I mean, it, it's been a while since I read it, but I do remember thinking it did. You want to explain? Yeah. It's this book about a society where everyone's the same. There aren't really any emotions or classes. Mm -hmm. There are no standards of wealth, and they have to take pills at the beginning of the period to take their emotions away, even so that like, people are, there's no such thing as individual living. Everybody pretty much has the same kind of thing. They live in the same size home. I think every family has two children, mm -hmm. things like that. The concept of love and marriage, like they have marriage, but it's not about love or, or even producing children as much as it is just about a unit to raise the children. Um, and there's only one person in the entire society who has memories of what, like, but there's only one person in the entire society who has memories of like, what an emotion feels like or what it even feel like to feel like the heat of a fire or something oh, like yeah. that. Only one person has that, and that he's known as the giver, and he stores all the memories, and they need to consult him about something they do, but most of these days by himself, because he is like a real person where everybody else is kind of this copy of everything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, yeah, thanks for kind of reminding me of that. To, to that, you know, I would say that's a critique of the platonic idea, you know? Um, I mean, it's, that, that's what it sounds like to me. But certainly it would have been, I'm sure that author, Lowry, right? Mm -hmm. I think, would have been um, inspired by the platonic idea. Yeah. Well, actually, okay, so that society, like, it's a series, and it all is kind of a critique. But, um, so there's like four other societies that they go to in the rest of the series. Um, but I would say probably the one that's closest to Plato's Republic is probably the second one. It's talking about this other society that's called Gathering Blue, anyway, but they go to, um, like, in that society, it's a little bit more like the kids run around and they are, like, all raised communally. Like, they don't actually, they have, like, birth mothers and everything, and they just, like, decide who's going to have a kid, and then they run around communally yeah. and everything. And so, like, I don't know. It's a little bit more like that, but it's, it's all kind of, like, all of it is kind of dystopic. It's just, it's a really good experience. That, yeah, I only read the first one, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Uh, I didn't well, know there was even a series. Here, yeah. Okay, yeah. I, I read it because my son was reading it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, that sounds like very much like the author probably had, you know, not only Plato's Republic, but a lot of other political philosophy in mind. And that's one of the cool things about studying political philosophy generally is that you do find an awful lot of literature draws from it. That in, in actually a lot of literature is a form of political philosophy too, which that certainly would be, um, it's kind of in the line of, you know, Animal Farm or, or 1984 and those kind of books, right? Um, that question to mm -hmm. I just think that's really uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, and dystopia is kind of a, a, you know, it's a fairly new word for something that goes back at least that far. That sort of comes from um, the critique of communism. 
Yep. Okay. Yep, so now, you know, like I said, it's questionable whether Plato actually thought that this was uh, de even desirable, because in a lot of other Platonic dialogues, we don't get a reputation uh, or a repetition of this particular proposal. We get other proposals, none of which are as radical as this one, okay? Um, but in response to Plato's ideas in the Republic, we have Aristotle, who, who seems to have thought that the Republic was kind of the, I guess, Plato's pre preferred form of government, um, and seems to have taken Plato's proposals quite seriously there. Um, so if Aristotle, who was Plato's student, um, is to be believed, Plato was, was uh, making a serious proposal there. And Aristotle, who in many ways took on Plato's points of view about justice and things like that, but he did disagree with Plato in a very fundamental way um, about the importance of the body. Whereas Plato thought that you know, the body always drags us down. You know, the body is our source of self-interest. If we didn't have a body, if we didn't have physical experiences, we would be able to think about the community. And so the attempt is to downplay the influence of the body as much as possible in Plato. Aristotle says, well, yeah, but, but we really can't do that. You know, the human experience is very physical. And um, the body, with its own particular feelings and experiences, they cannot be completely shared. Remember, Bill Clinton was famous for saying, I feel your pain, right? Well, maybe you don't know, but he was. And I'm sure he did to a certain extent. He was really good at hugging people and trying to empathize with them. Don't even go there. But, um, but nevertheless, okay, um, People's pain cannot be fully shared, right? And this, this is Aristotle's point. You can empathize, but your pain, as well as your pleasure, all of your physical uh, experiences remain pretty private. And for that reason, he didn't think there was any way around this, so we have to work with it. Okay? So Aristotle um, basically said, to a certain extent, we have to, we have to accept self-interest, and we have to create political and economic structures that take it into account, that don't so fight against it. And there's a way of doing that um, in his view, okay? So one of the things that Aristotle not only accepted, but actually extolled as good is the notion of private property. Um, he said, you know, the problem with communism is that uh, if people don't own any property, they will not take care of the common property in the same way that they would take care of their own. So there will be waste and there will be, you know, things will break down. Um, whereas if people have the ability to own property, they can be made to associate their ownership with the <coughs> strength of the community. So. If I have a house and some land, it doesn't mean that I ignore the community. Supposedly it means that I tie up my ability to securely own that property with the power of the community and with being a citizen. <coughs> so I have a stake in the community. I have something to lose, you might say, in that property. So I have a real interest in making sure that the community is strong, that the laws are good, that they are observed, and those kinds of things. And so Aristotle emphasized the citizen experience, you know, the idea that you, the best form of life for the human being is a political life, which just meant to be a citizen, a very active citizen, in the truest sense of the word. Okay? So, so we have two, two philosophers, in some ways very much alike, but disagree very profoundly about the good of private property um, and the form of government that is best. All right. Will it be private property or collective property? And Aristotle basically saying that um, we need self-interest to actually balance moral duty. Okay? 
meaning that to ground it, to make it informed by actual people's experience, right? the political process has to have that self-interest. Um, we create better citizens, he said, not necessarily just through philosophy, but through habituation. So he placed a lot of emphasis on good laws. Habituation is just getting people to behave in a certain way, which hopefully will train them to think about justice and about the common good. Plato thought that, rightly understood, we would all know what justice was without having to be sort of prodded to act on it. So you can see that Aristotle thought human beings were kind of more fundamentally flawed. Okay? Uh, so more like Boglin's in between. Okay? Um, and they needed good laws, they needed to be encouraged to be good citizens, and the good government would do that, would encourage people to be real citizens. Okay. So that's a little bit of background. The Platonic view versus the Aristotelian view can be a sort of shorthand for the communist view versus the capitalist view, although I wouldn't want to go all the way there because certainly Aristotle would not necessarily put a rubber stamp on all of capitalism. But there's, there's structures of thought there that, that they can tap into. All right, so some of you remember St. Thomas More, right? Okay. Thomas More was a close advisor to King Henry VIII. He was Chancellor of England at one point. Um, good friend of the king, but he fell out with the king, as you know, uh, over the king's first divorce to his first wife, Catherine. He went on to divorce a lot of other women, too, but uh, Thomas More didn't survive the first one. He was executed um, for that and for disagreeing with the king's uh, decision to create the Church of England. But what I'm interested in, and why I teach it in my intro class, is his vision of utopia, because this is an example of a sort of Christian-inspired uh, socialism. Okay? And it's just an example, uh, one of many actually, of socialist proposals made by Christian thinkers. Um, if you take the political thought to the 16th century, we cover the medieval period, and there are you know, Christian theologians, Catholic theologians going back a long ways that proposed various ideas of what we would now identify as socialism. So socialism as an idea has a very long history is what I'm trying to get across, okay? Um, so in Moore's Utopia, which he wrote in the 16th century, so this is during the early modern period, you might say, um, he contrasts his England with his utopian vision. And he doesn't commit the problem that Vogelin crit criticizes, because he does seem to understand that this is a utopia, or this is a moral ideal. Um, he does not write anywhere that he thinks that this is our future, necessarily, or that you know, we will all live this way or should all live this way. It remains an ideal. But it's an inspiration, which Marx ended up calling uh, and criticizing as utopian socialism. So before liberal theory emerged, that is the theory of our founders or the theory of Hobbes and Locke and our founders, socialism was not reacting to capitalism because capitalism didn't exist. Right? but was reacting to selfishness and greed, you know, the sort of indifference of the wealthy towards the poor, government favoritism of economic elites. That was big on Thomas More's list. You know, the idea that the king or whoever was in charge would make sure that the nobles and his, all of his buddies were well taken care of with land and with, with goods and with power, right? So socialists thought was reacting more to, not even to private property, but to selfishness and the misuse of property. Um, and so you can see that the Christian thinkers could make such arguments fairly easily. 
because that would be sin. And in fact, that's exactly what they said for the most part. Thomas More doesn't use that term. Kind of interesting. But for earlier thinkers, it was really explicit. You know, this is sinful behavior. If you have property, you should share it. You should not, you know, use it to abuse others. You should use your position to help other people and so forth. Okay? All right, so the purpose of Moore's utopia. And again, a little bit unlike earlier medieval visions, which had more to do with religion, um, was to create this society which was not materialistic, which was about love of other people, sociability, people getting together, spending time together, studying and talking together, etc. that was peaceful, that was morally pure as possible. I and mean, you know in Utopia it wasn't assumed that moral purity would be something that just happened to people. It would have to be kind of enforced and encouraged by the, by the communist government. And of course leisure was a big deal. Ease and leisure was a big deal for more because with that leisure that comes from spending less time making material things, you could have time to spend with other people doing interesting things. Can you see how close that is to the minimalists? Remember the minimalists, the two guys? Okay. They basically said, what are you working for? You know, this is not a typical modern socialist argument. Right? What are you working for? It, to get stuff that you don't need. Well, what would you do with all that time if you weren't working? Okay. All right. So, that being said, and I'll have to continue this on Friday, but we've got some common socialist assumptions and claims that run throughout, all the way from Plato to you know the early Christians through the medieval theologians uh, to the early modern people all the way to, to modern Marxism. Um, first big idea is much labor in capitalist society produces useless things. That's the minimalists. <coughs> and they're not really, I mean, if you ask those guys, well, so you're socialist, they would say, no, we haven't really thought about that. Okay? So they're not really socialists, you know, but they are making a point that socialists also make. Um, that we work long and hard for stuff that really isn't necessary and might even not, that might even make us unhappy, right? Like Moore said, you know, a lot of wealthy people, they want to collect burgers and they want to collect, you know, fancy furniture and but, but then what happens? Well, they kind of compete with each other and, and it creates this desire for more that's never satisfied is a point that Plato often made. So, I mean, these are just two examples. I heard a Wall Street Journal story about some, like, half a meal box, actually, in Sweden or Denmark, one of those countries, that's now going to somehow be turned into some sort of virtual reality headset. And that sounds like a pretty damn expensive half a meal box, but okay, you know. <laughs> um, consumer items generally be critiqued this way. Um, all right. So the point there being that the more that you spend thinking about these things, the less you spend thinking about things that are free, basically. And there's a sort of demotion in people's minds that these free things are not as like worthy or as important as the things that you pay for. Okay. Problem exists, like for instance, with the uh, stay-at-home moms, you know, there, there's a movement afoot, you know, has been for a long time, but you still hear about it, um, that somehow they ought to be paid, because the notion is, if they're not paid, their work isn't as, is going to not be seen as as worthy as um, paid work. Okay. One more big idea, which is, all work, all should work in some capacity. Everybody who is not disabled or too old or in some way 
unable should work. Uh, Thomas More certainly made this point. He said, the vast majority of people are idle, he said, between the wealthy and the clergy, and he said, the, well, at least the upper class women and the uh, idle poor. He listed all of these different um, groups of people. If they could all be employed, in other words, if everybody could work that could possibly work, no one would have to work as hard. And you combine that with only working to produce things that people actually need, need then you've got very little work at all. Okay? Um, so some of the things that come out of that view are uh, this notion of, of rotating people um, in and out of the countryside, in the case of Thomas More, so that they have an experience doing different kinds of work and living a different way of life. Okay. Using work, in other words, for a sort of social purpose, um, which is just interesting. We don't normally think of work as, as creating a social good, but in this case it would if people go and experience what it's like to farm and therefore come to respect people who do that kind of work. Yeah. Um, but on the other side of that coin, though, I mean, I realize they would need less to be produced, but wouldn't that create like, massive problems with inefficiency? Well, if you don't need as much, then inefficiency can be a little bit more acceptable. Well, yeah, but it, it would create some inefficiency. In that case, it's like farming is what he was talking about. Like, mm -hmm. But then you have to basically constantly retrain people on a farm if you ever have enough food done. That's, well, you know what? It, and I think it's a valid uh, concern, right? Because his proposal is let's take half of those people off the farm every two years and put another yeah. half of people in that have not done it before, that would seem to create such a steep you know, learning curve. People would spend most of their time figuring out how to do it. There was supposed to be a core group of people on these farms, but still, I think the concern is valid and it's often raised about these types of issues, which Marx, by the way, Marx had this notion of, of moving people out into the countryside and creating a sort of industrialized agriculture and all of that. Um, but, you know, and in, it, and in, his, in historical terms, it was very inefficient and produced starvation when they tried it uh, under Lenin and, and then again with Stalin. Um, so I think it's a very valid concern. Moore didn't think that, if a, let's put it this way, Moore seemed to think if everybody was truly working as hard as they could for the common good, the very simple needs, that there would not be enough inefficiency to create the problem. So if everybody's rotating around, nobody's going to become a expert or like totally proficient in any one thing. Right. So wouldn't that just stop growth altogether? You wouldn't be able to develop new technologies. You wouldn't be able to uh, discover anything new that way. Well, what would be, what would be the rebuttal for that, I guess? I guess the rebuttal to that would be there would be people who would spend most of their life on the farm. And there would be people who would spend most of their life in the city because this rotation was not continuous. It was like every two years you move back and forth. But at some point in your life you would spend some time on the farm. Um, whether that's good enough, I don't know. But the, the socialist response would typically go like this. Capitalism creates all sorts of inefficiencies or you know, self-interest produces inefficiencies of producing all sorts of stuff that we don't need and other people starve. So they would point out the inefficiencies related to private the system and private property. Um, now, and we're out of time, so we'll get back into that, try to get back into that on Friday.